Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the sixth lecture, I think. And we will start the lecture as every week with the privacy policy. So it is the fifth, right, Patrick? Sorry? Today is the fifth lecture. Uh, yes, I think so. Well, we continue with the point mass model. Last week, we stopped at the longitudinal model. And before starting with the flipped classroom and with your presentation from group A, I would like to start uh, yeah, showing you the point mass model. It is a simple model, uh, consists of just three equations. These are the acceleration in X direction, the acceleration in Y direction, and the constraint, the well-known constraint that comes circle. This model, as you see, ignores minimum turning radius. There is no radius in this model, uh, which means that the vehicle can uh, turn around itself, can spin, can move to every direction instantaneously. Um, but it is simple and for some purposes, it is uh, good. So the block diagram of this model consists of these two diagrams. So as always, we start with the output, the position in the X direction, the velocity in the X direction in between the integrator and the acceleration in the X direction and in between the integrator. The same for the um, Y direction. And here we see the state space model uh, of the point pass model. Uh, we define four states. These are the position, two states for the position, and the um, velocity, two states for, for the velocity. The inputs are the acceleration in X and Y direction. Well, uh, X1 dot is X3, as you see. But the, the change of the position is the velocity. These are the two first uh, states. And the change of the velocity is the acceleration. These are the two states here, or state equations. Here you see, again, the block diagram to remember it when writing the equations. And we can write the state space model in a compact form. It is linear, so it, the general equation is x dot equals a x plus b u. Here is the state space vector. So the first derivative of it equals a matrix A times the state vector plus a matrix multiplied by the input vector. Well, this is the point mass model. And um, we have also an exercise about it in 
the exercise sheet about vehicle models. So for the exercise for last week was about the longitudinal model. You have done it, hopefully. And for today, you are going to do the exercise two point mass model. And of course, after today, you will be able also to do uh, the exercise about kinematic bicycle model. And also exercise for hopefully, if we are fast enough. Well, going back to the models. So the point mass model, its usefulness depends on the application. As always in um, in modeling, we start with the modeling goal, and the usefulness depends on the goal in uh, in the first step. Well, model assumptions we have met in in this model are many. We have a very sim simple model. We just consider the whole vehicle as a point mass. And we consider the accelerations in both directions. This is the verbal description uh, of the model, what I described now. Um, yeah, examples for modeling goals, uh, which are suitable for, for this model, um, let me give you an example. Uh, racing could be a possible application if if we can consider the the limits of the acceleration. If we want to to use for the um, for the trajectory planning of racing um, a simple model in an optimization to be fast enough to have the inputs uh, in real time, it is possible to use this model with some additional uh, constraints. An example where this uh, model isn't suitable is uh, parking of uh, normal road vehicles. So for parking, we have to consider the minimum turning radius of a vehicle. And this, this is what we don't find in, in this model. So it is um, suitable for this. We have seen the block diagram, the model equations, and for the validation, uh, we have spoken about it. You can use the um, different com complex models. Now coming to the first flip, flipped classroom of this course. So we communicated with, with you um, on Monday, I think, that team A should prepare a summary around 15 minutes about the kinematic single track model. Uh, you should have read section 2.2 of vehicle dynamics and control. Um, it's around seven pages. And you have also got uh, additional uh, reading resources for deepening your knowledge. So I'm excited about the presentation of team A. Um, I should stop sharing my screen to give you the possibility to share your screen. But first, I should find how to do it. Uh, I don't want to leave the meeting. Um, OK. 
Okay, I found it. So please go ahead. Who is in charge of the next 15 minutes? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear yeah. you. <laughs> so um, okay. me and Sue, we will um, do the presentation um, for this week's flipped classroom. Fine. <laughs> Um, Exciting. So please, uh, in Zoom, in the bottom, you have the green button, uh, button, uh, Bildschirm freigeben, mm. screen sharing. So use it to uh, share your screen. Is it visible? Yeah. Oh, wait a moment. Oh. Yeah, so um, yeah, I will just start maybe. Um, we thought or uh, we made a presentation and also we discussed about the um, kinematic single track model. And um, first I will tell you which contents this presentation will include. Um, so we will talk, first talk about the idea and the bicycle model itself. Then we will say something about the equations that result from the bicycle model. And then um, we will continue with the Ackermann turning geometry and uh, conclude the presentation with the limitations. So I will start with um, the idea now. And um, yeah, so, so the basic idea of our um, model is to create a simplified model of lateral vehicle motion. So this is kind of important because um, if you consider the street, if uh, cars change the line, then that's a point where, for example, many accidents happen. So that's why um, it is very important to think about uh, lateral vehicle motion and also to think about concepts, how to make um, those motion more easier. And um, our model um, assumes our, our models motion only based on geom uh, geometries, but not forces. Um, so we basically just look at different angles and how they play together. And to make um, those more easier, we merge together in a four-wheeled um, four vehicle, the two front and the two uh, rear wheels. So they are presented just by one central wheel that is connected just by a line. And that's why it, it's called a bicycle model because it basically looks like a bicycle. And um, another consideration is that in this model, we only use planar movement and uh, in many cases also the steering will only be front wheel steering. I mean there are both cases for the bicycle models but um, also when you see a bicycle then often just the back wheel will stay steady while the front wheel will be the one that is steering. So that's the basic idea. And I will continue to talk about the model itself. Um, here's first the very basic model that we are talking about. Um, if you look at A and B, then um, you can see the two wheels of the bicycle model, and they are connected by a line. In the middle, you can find C, which is the center of gravity. And um, the distance from C to A or C to B is considered as uh, LF or LR. And another um, very important factor is um, now this phi here in, in, in the figure. And this is um, the difference of the angle of the whole bicycle um, in comparison to the coordinate system. So you can see there's a YX coordinate system and um, that's what this yaw angle is all about. Um, 
so in the next step, we can calculate more angles. Um, very important, of course, are the steering angles, which are here um, shown as delta F and delta R. Um, yeah, we, we said before already that sometimes just the front steering is considered, so maybe sometimes the delta R will not be um, uh, of that high importance as the delta F. And um, we also consider the velocity vector, which is now um, marked as V in this picture. And um, the velocity vector basically um, yeah, is, is, is the difference of the steering and the current, um, the current position of the whole bicycle wheelbase. And um, the difference or the difference between those, um, yeah, the, the bicycle's complete angle and the um, velocity vector is this beta, which is the slip angle, or it's called the slip angle. If we go one point uh, further, then um, yeah, when you think about a bicycle which is turning then basically you could consider that there is some point which is called a rolling center that it is rotates around. And um, you can see in this figure that we can draw lines uh, perpendicular to the wheels uh, that meet at that rolling point, um, as well as a line perpendicular to the um, velocity vector which meets at that rolling point. And this is also the radius of the um, of that um, um, like kind of curve that you go around the rolling center. Yeah, so that's the basics for for the model. And now we come to the equations. Um, they are um, maybe a little bit for the beginning, a little bit um, not that intuitive. So I will just uh, sum up what they are about. We first start with um, parameters and variables, which are given in the model and important to um, calculate all the angles. So it would be the position of the center of gravity, the yaw angle that we talk about, the ve uh, vehicle velocity at the center of gravity, then the front wheel steering an angle, the steering angle that is currently as an input there. Then we have the time constant of the steering system, the time delay of the steering system, um, the side sl slip angle that we talked about before, which is like that difference between the velocity vector and the current angle of the complete um, bicycle. And at the end, the wheelbase, which is basically just um, those two, um, parts from the center to the wheels just put together. So the just the whole uh, bicycle itself, length of the bicycle. And um, if you consider those vari variables or parameters, then we will come to a number of equations so that we could actually calculate, um, calculate some of those um, variables or parameters with that equations. And you can already see that most of them um, use uh, like a cosine or a sine. Uh, that's because we are just, um, as I said already in the beginning, we are just based on um, geometrical features and angles, but not on forces. So we can just, um, yeah, always just calculate the angles. And the first two equations here, you will, you can just see. Um, yeah, like the overall equation of motion. And we consider it regarding to the coordinate, coordinate system and like in the direction of X or Y. And to calculate that, um, we use the velocity vector, of course, but also we need um, the angular velocity and the side slip to, to calculate that, um, that motion. And um, in the third, equation, we, we just want to calculate the angular velocity. And um, here we consider the velocity vector, the steering angle and the side slip. And we, we just divide it by the 
by the current wheelbase. Um, the fourth um, equation is the vehicle velocity. And the fifth equation, we, um, we think about the steering angle and we basically um, calculate that by the current st steering angle and the input steering angle uh, with respect to like time constants and time delays. And the last equation, we calculate the side, uh, side slip. Um, and yeah, for that, we basically, basically um, have to calculate that, that um, angle at the center of the, of the bicycle and we use for that the front steering and consider just the front part of the wheelbase divided by the wheelbase. Um, yeah, so that's as much as for my part. And we will continue now with the Ackermann turning geometry. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Can I share my screen? Yes, you okay. can. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, Anna. I'm going to present the rest parts of the presentation. Um, as is already introduced, the bicycle model is based on the assumption that uh, one front wheel represents both the left and the right front wheels. Uh, but uh, in fact, it is not the case because the turning radius is different for each wheel. And uh, in the right picture, it shows us the basic idea of the Ackman turning geometry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the right picture shows us the basic idea of the Ackerman geometry. In this concept, both wheels are considered. And we can see that three lines which are perpendicular to the both rear wheels and the outer front steering wheel and the inner steering wheel uh, intersect at point O, which is the center of the uh, turning circle. And the L represents the uh, wheelbase and the LW represents the uh, track width. If the wheelbase L is small compared to the R and the slip angle beta is small, we can approximately uh, derive that the heading angle velocity over uh, the speed of the vehicle is equal to one over R which is also equal to delta equal to uh, over L. Here, delta is the average steering angle of the uh, outer steering angle and the inner steering angle. And now uh, we take a closer attention to the both steering angles. Here with approximation, we can get the outer steering angle delta, the, uh, delta O is equal to uh, L over R plus LW half, and the inner steering angle dirt I is equal to L over R minus LW half. With these two equations, we can conclude that the difference between the two steering angles is delta squared uh, multiply LW over L. We can see that this term LW over L is a constant term. So this tells us the difference between the inner and the outer steering angle is proportional to the square of the 
average steering angle. So that is to say, if we have bigger uh, steering angle, the difference between the two steering angles cannot be ignored. This problem can be addressed with a so-called trapezoidal geometry. In this animation at the corner, you can see that when we steering now uh, at the central position, when we steering now to the left, the left steering inner uh, angle is bigger than the right one. And when we now steering to the right, the inner steering angle is also larger than the outer steering angle. Yeah, this tells us the inner steering wheel always turns a larger steering angle. Okay. After introducing the Ackman uh, turning geometry, I would like to discuss uh, about the limitations of the bicycle model. As you can imagine, uh, one limitation I want to introduce is that the bicycle model only focuses on the motion, uh, which is based on the geometry, and we neglected the forces. For the first point I want to mention is that we assume that there's no tire lateral slip, but there's but this is not the case in the real world. Uh, as we can see from the first equation, we know that the total lateral forces is proportional to the square of the speed of the vehicle and inversely proportional to the radius of the turning circle. So that is to say, the lateral forces could be higher than the tolerated force by the higher at high speed and small radius. But in our bicycle model, we assume that uh, R is equal to LF plus LR over tangent dart F uh, multiply cosine beta. And this term, the radius, minimum curve radius does not depend on the velocity. velocity. And this is also the same for the slip angle beta. It also only depends on the steering angle and the geometry. We cannot take into account the tire lateral slip. Another point I want to uh, say is the rolling resistance and aerodynamic drag cannot be considered. If there is a big wind, the bicycle model uh, will fail. Furthermore, uh, the bicycle model only focuses on the planar motion. In other words, the center of the gravity is assumed to be at the height uh, zero. And all the pitch and the road dynamics of the vehicle cannot be uh, considered. The last but not least, uh, I want to say the bicycle model is a single track model. And it, as we, uh, as we have mentioned that the front and the rear wheels are only represented by one central wheel. So the difference, so such kind of single track model cannot be capable for modeling the difference between the inner and outer steering angles. Overall, uh, the bicycle model can only be used for slow cornering. At low speed with high radius, the tire lateral slip can, assumed, can be assumed uh, at zero. Secondly, if it is, uh, it is, there's no need to model the suspension and we, can, uh, we don't have to model the uh, row and page of the vehicle, it's a good idea to use the bicycle model. Thirdly, if we don't take the driving resistance into account. For example, we uh, did some simulation and experiments in the lab. The driving resistance is uh, very small and it can be neglected. Uh, in this case, the bicycle model is a good option. Of course, for more accuracy of motion, uh, further models are required. For example, the longitudinal and lateral dynamics model is required to model the uh, force. And uh, additionally, the tire model is also necessary for us to model the tire lateral slip. OK, yeah, that's the end of our presentation. And uh, thank you very much.
for your attention. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you can uh, share your screen again for, for questions. Okay. So uh, for the participants, if you have questions to Anna and Sue, just turn on your microphone and go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, as you introduced uh, all the vari uh, variables, I think uh, on page six, yeah. Yeah. Um, you said that the change of the velocity uh, is zero. And maybe I missed something in the book, but I do not really understand why you assume that. Because I think in the book they said that um, it's the time varying function. And I understood that um, you can yeah, model the velocity. Um, for example, with the old model we learned in the last lecture. Um, and I think in this model, the velocity could also, or the change of the velo uh, velocity could also be something else than zero. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, I actually took those, um, those equations from um, our additional literature. Ah, okay. I think it is. It, I think it is just for one case, um, but I was also not sure about it while reading. I don't know if any of our group members want to say something to it. Um, one comment only, this is just a kinematic model, so we are, uh, don't looking for uh, accelerations here. So this is, should be just velocity, so the velocity change should be zero. Yeah, yeah right. Okay, but does the model fail if we have a velocity change other than the zero? Uh, what do you mean by this? So, uh, so if you if you use the um, the model with a changing velocity, does it change something big? Yes, I think so uh, because. Uh, in this bicycle model, we just uh, focus on the geometry of the uh, uh, geometry of the the vehicle and the model. So all the forces are neglected, as I mentioned in the limitation. And if we take into account the uh, the, the driving resistance and uh, the acceleration, the model will fail. I think you have to use another model then if you want to if you want to also model those uh, forces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's true. If we if we have a change of velocity, then they, then we have forces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have a comment on this in a second. Okay. Please, if you have further questions, just turn on your microphone. Well, very good. I enjoyed your presentation and uh, the discussion is it's, it's really a good question. Uh, I have uh, a general comment. Uh, you have taken the pictures and equations from sources. So uh, it's recommended in also in slides uh, to, to write down where you have this uh, picture or this equation from. Mm. This is just a minor feedback. I have also a general question. Uh, Anna and Sue, what's, uh, are, you a, are you a team? Are you uh, we, um, no. we are in one group and not a team. Not a team. Okay. What yeah. are your study programs? Uh, I study automation engineering. I study computer science. Okay, very good. Well, um, so after this lecture, Patrick will ask you to provide him with the, with the slides and he will also ask you if we can use your uh, uh, 
the, the recordings of your of your presentation. So thank you very much. Please stop the screen sharing okay. so that I can share my screen. So now it's my screen. So I have also prepared a summary. I will go uh, rapidly through, through my summary and comment on, uh, on some topics. But before starting with my summary, I would like to mention uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, the variable names in my presentation are slightly different from the variable names in the presentation of Anna and Sue. So it is just uh, the names. The second thing I would like to, to mention before starting my presentation is that uh, for clarity of presentation, I omitted the time argument in some equations. So it is uh, sometimes clear the variable depends on time or, or not, and I omitted it. For example, in uh, uh, in this drawing of the single track model, the kinematic single track model, I omitted the time argument completely. Fine. Uh, we saw this uh, picture in the presentation of, uh, of Anna and Sue, and it was really very, very well explained. I'm not going to explain it uh, again. And here also we see on uh, on the left the description of the of the variables. They were also very well explained. Uh, just uh, a comment: uh, the yaw angle could be also named orientation or heading angle. So the three names are equivalent. Equivalent. Well, the assumptions, uh, you presented it also very well. You uh, stressed also the uh, most important or the most strong assumption. I call it strong assumption. And a strong assumption, what is the definition of a strong assumption? Uh, it is, in my words, a strong assumption leads to a major difference between model and reality. So the Assumption number, number six, that the velocity vectors at point A and B are parallel to the front and rear wheels, respectively, is the most strong assumption here because we neglect uh, the forces. You also, um, what does it mean? Uh, in assumption number, number six, to have the velocity vectors at point A and B parallel to the front and rear wheels. Um, yeah, in general, this is valid for small tires lateral forces, which means as we saw in the presentation of Anna and Sue, uh, it's valid for low speed or big radius. And we saw uh, this, equation more or less in, in the presentation of uh, Anna and Sue. Um, yeah, here is the lateral force, mass times uh, acceleration, the Newton's law, and we can derive from it that the, the maximum acceleration is the root of uh, a lot max times RC, and we can derive from it what is the maximum accel uh, velocity to um, yeah, for for this model. So we we define a maximum lateral acceleration, and we can derive from it a maximum velocity. So in uh, this model, actually the states are mainly the position and the orientation. 
in difference to the point mass model, here we have the orientation. It is the additional thing here. And the orientation goes also uh, in the definition of, uh, or in the equations of the velocities in X and in Y directions. Um, and what, what's all about here in this model is to derive an equation for psi dot, which is the change of the orientation. And this is actually an, an assumption. It is not really equals, it is just for low speeds. I will correct it. So it is uh, the velocity to, to the radius. And in general, applying the sign rule in three angles and some trigonometric functions, we get an equation for the radius. This is what, what, we, what we need. We have uh, psi dot equals v to rc, and we need some equation for rc, and this is uh, the equation. And we can substitute and get uh, an equation for psi dot, and also from the um, equations, or from the sine rule in three angles and the trigonometric functions, we can get also an equation for beta. So now a comment on, on the velocity. The velocity in this model or the acceleration in general, the longitudinal dynamics is- Sorry, um, one of our members couldn't uh, get in again. She lost connection. Let's say it again. Uh, one of our guys lost the connection. It should be Anna. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Patrick, could you, could you let her in? Uh, you, done. Thanks for the notice. Okay, thanks. Okay, welcome again, Anna. So that Velocity, I was saying that the longitudinal dynamics, velocity acceleration is an external in, in this uh, model. It is not part of the model, it is something external. And in dependence on, uh, on the assumptions we meet, uh, it depends on the modeling goal. If we say, okay, we choose in this model to have a constant velocity, then it is case one v dot is zero, or we say we have, or we allow an acceleration, then it is number two, v dot is uh, the acceleration. Of course, we can uh, make it more complicated. Uh, yeah, if we, if we also consider the change of the acceleration. And in case if beta is zero, the slip angle, the side slip angle, then we can put v dot is equals a longitudinal. And of course we can use at this point the, um, the longitudinal model we saw in, in the last lecture. Of course you can also, uh, use the knowledge you learned also in the last lecture about, uh, or two lectures ago, uh, about modeling in general and about first order models. And here is a further possibility to, uh, to have a first order model for the velocity. So you see for the velocity, it's an external input and there are many possibilities. Also you can do it very much complicated um, because considering the longitudinal forces, you can also consider um, the, yeah. You can cancel more assumptions we, 
we, we met at the beginning, uh, for example, the um, in, in general, let's say I would, don't want to, to mention just one in general, uh, considering also the, the forces on the on the tires leads to uh, more complicated model. So here it is. This slide is just to raise your attention that there are many possibilities to model uh, the velocity. And for the steering angle, it is more or less the same. Uh, there are also many possibilities. If you would assume that the steering angle is in instantaneously there, if you ask for a steering angle, then it is without time shift there, you could say, okay, uh, the input or the steering input is just the steering, delta t. If you would say no, uh, I would like to uh, to consider the um, the dynamics. You can use also a first order system. It is a very good approximation with a time constant t delta, and you you can get this. You can also use the uh, first order model from the presentation uh, of Anna and Sue, where they add also a time delay to the first order system. It's also completely fine. Or if you would like, you can say, okay, I, I would like to use uh, the steering uh, velocity as an input. Some people do it also. Uh, they say, okay, uh, actually I, the steering velocity is the right input for the lateral dynamics for several, several reasons. We don't have to, to discuss here, but it is also possible. And in my opinion, you're completely uh, free to choose between delta, delta in and V delta. So here we see the summary of the model. As we saw, the equations for the velocity, for the orientation, for the change of the longitudinal velocity and the um, steering angle and the side slip angle, which actually is a parameter in this model. It is not a state. And here we see some extensions of uh, to, to this model using uh, steering constraints because we said, okay, this model is uh, or for the derivation for the derivative or to derive this model, we use the assumption also that the lateral forces are neglected. Um, forces uh, if we, if we assume that the mass is constant, more or less the acceleration. And here we have uh, an approximation for the equation of the lateral acceleration. And in this equation, we, uh, we find also delta, the steering angle. And we can rewrite this equation to get a maximum steering angle for a predefined maximum acceleration. If we say, okay, this model isn't fine for a huge lateral acceleration, then we could say, okay, let's define a maximum lateral acceleration, for example, uh, G to two, which is almost uh, five meter per second square. Then it's fine, you can uh, use this equation as a constraint to, um, yeah to consider the limitations of the model. So what we lose using the assumptions we can consider in the model using constraints. The same for, for the other models. And here we see the, a drawing of the block diagram 
I know uh, the general definition in of block diagrams to, uh, doesn't contain uh, non-linear blocks, but for simplicity, I use just the non-linear blocks. Of course, if you want to get linear block diagram, you have to uh, linearize the non-linear uh, equations. And what we we see here is here the input for the velocity. There are several ways to get it. This one is just one of them. And for the steering, there are also several ways. This is just one of the possibilities. What you what we notice looking at the um, at the block diagram, there are many nonlinear blocks, and uh, actually the this model is highly nonlinear because of the sine and cosine functions. And I'll have a comment on this in a second. So here we we see the uh, state space model of the kinematic model. The states are the position, the orientation. And if you would like, it depends uh, how, uh, how you would like to, uh, to model which assumptions you meet and so on. You can also have two additional states uh, these are the velocity and the uh, steering angle. And uh, yeah, for the input, we can use uh, the velocity of the steering angle or the input to the steering angle or the steering angle itself. And if we use the steering angle itself, we don't need X5. Well, so we uh, come to a summary to the kinematic about the kinematic model. So usefulness depends again on application. For for example, for parking, I would assume it is suitable. Uh, if you would like to to have spinning in uh, in driving, it is uh, less sweated. So I'm not going to discuss the modeling steps. Please uh, think about the modeling steps. What we uh, what we did in in deriving the kinematic model. You can also discuss in your teams or groups. There is also uh, a MATLAB exercise. I've shown it. So the first discussion point about the kinematic model is uh, the side slip angle beta. And uh, we assume or we derive the model for the center of gravity. And at the center of gravity, we have a side slip angle. It is better. And if we would like to have a side slip angle beta of zero to simplify the equations, we should shift the center of gravity, not the center of gravity, but the, the point we are deriving the model for to, to the rear of the, uh, of the vehicle. So it would be uh, at point B, if you if you remember the model, so this here was point B, and this was point A, or is point A, and yeah, what we see on on this slide is how to. Uh, transfer the velocity of the center to the rear. The equations you, you see here are three geometric, three geometric functions. And uh, yeah, 
I am not going to explain them in detail. I have written them down uh, because you don't find them in, in literature. So they, uh, you can get them from this slide. Yeah, the kinematic model is highly nonlinear. And because of the high linearity of the model, if we linearize it, we have some issues. We, we lose a lot through linearization. And we have to know this and to keep uh, this in, in mind. Uh, if you think about the equations again, you will see that a turning using a linearized model is possible till 90 degrees, which means if we have here the coordinates, here is our vehicle. And at this point, we, uh, we choose a turning radius, uh, turning uh, a steering angle, sorry. Of some radius, and we use the linearized model, then we can get just this curve. And actually using the non-linear model and what would what would you what you would also expect you using a constant steering angle you would expect to drive in a circle like so if we if we would start here Let's assume this is a circle. Fine. So you see uh, the difference or a difference between the linearized and non-linearized model. They, uh, there is, I said, a difference and the difference uh, gets bigger and bigger in, uh, in time. Well, this makes uh, the linearized model, for example, suitable for almost uh, small steering angles. Um, yeah, less accurate for big steering angles. Fine. So before starting with the single track model, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, so just turn on your microphone and ask your questions. You can direct your questions also to Anna and Sue if you would like. Yeah, I have, I have one more question. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, I think um, as you presented some possibilities for the velocity change, um, you said that if you want to use the longitudinal model, you constrict better to be zero. And I did not fully understand why you constrain better to be zero, especially because in the book they explicitly um, presented the model as a model for the velocity V. Yeah, in in the book they say, I think V is an external input, and we could also model it uh, as uh, using a longitudinal model in general. They didn't say which longitudinal model exactly. And uh, if you would like to use the longitudinal model we presented in this lecture, it is uh, valid for the. Um, 
for the vehicle axis, not for the uh, velocity direction. So it is a longitudinal model and we don't consider the, um, the, the, the lateral direction. So if we go to some picture here, Our okay, so is valid for this direction, and this model or the velocity here is not parallel to the vehicle axis. There is uh, a side slip angle in between, and if you would like to use the longitudinal model, even if we have a side slip angle, then you have to uh, to move the point we are deriving the model for to the back of the vehicle as explained in, in one of the slides. And at this point, we can derive the, um, the model for, for this point for beta equals zero, which simplifies uh, the equations also additionally. Mm, okay. But does the model, the longitudinal model, model more than the change of uh, velocity? The, um, yeah. So I, I just asked myself if you just wanted to uh, model the velocity um, with the um, equations we derived uh, last time. Um, you, you, you painted this uh, block diagram. Um, then why should I constrict the direction of V to be equal to the, um, yeah, to the, oh, in other words, why should I constrict, uh, constrain B better to be zero? Because I, I don't understand why the direction has to be equal to the direction of the vehicle. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's, because I, I, and my, and I, I thought that the, the longitudinal model is just a model of the, of the speed and of the velocity and as of the acceleration and the direction of, the, of these parameters or of these variables does not matter. Oh, it does uh, matter. It is uh, actually for the longitudinal direction. And uh, yeah, notice that we have here also two frames. We have the global XY frame, and we have also the, uh, the vehicle frame. And the longitudinal model is for the X direction in the vehicle frame. But can't I assume that our, um, our yeah, that the longitudinal or the, um, the axes I use for the longitudinal model are always, um, the point of the vector uh, or point in the direction of the vector v, so that I turn the coordinate system by moving the the car. So you know what I mean. That that yeah. we we assume that we just drive uh, in one direction, but yeah. the, I. I think the direction where we're driving does not matter. I can, if V changes, I can also, uh, or in other words, if I, if I sit on V, then in my view, I'd always drive forward. Why should I go back to, on to the to point B? Um, then I, the only thing that changes is that I look in the direction of the, um, of the vehicle. Yeah, because the model is for the, um, it is a longitudinal model. Uh, maybe to, uh, to get it more, assume that the, the vehicle is sliding to, to the side. For example, using uh, a, ter uh, a steering angle of 90 degrees. And this, is, this would be the, uh, the velocity vector. Um, if we, if we call the model longitudinal model, then we are speaking about uh, the speed of the vehicle in the longitudinal direction and not 
in the uh, in the lateral direction. Of course, if it would be valid for this direction with different parameters, I didn't think about it. Patrick, do you have a comment on, on this? Uh, not really. So yeah, I think it makes sense. Or I was looking up for a definition of uh, this longitudinal. What, what does this mean? So if that means um, in the direction of the vehicle axis, then I cannot argue that I change the, the, the direction in which, which I look with the uh, velocity vector. But yeah, I, I, I couldn't find what the definition of longitudinal means. But yeah, I guess if we define longitudinal model to be the, a movement into the vehicle axis direction, then. Okay, I, I totally understand if we, if we say that this model um, or the longitudinal model always has to point in the direction of the vehicle, then it's clear that we can't do it like I said. Um, but I just was thinking about the, the equations behind this model. And if I, and I thought that, yeah, this longitudinal model, this name describes the equations and that I can apply these equations um, and on, uh, on every, every velocity I, I want to apply it on. So, but if you say that longitudinal model implies that I always have to drive in the direction of the vehicle, so that the axes always are the same as the axis of the vehicle, then I think it's clear that you can't do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't know if it would be valid for different param parameters. So I, I would think about it and uh, maybe I would have a more detailed answer till next week. So, but I have written down the model for the uh, direction of the vehicle axis. Um, uh, I have to, to think in, in more detail about it. Nice. So do you have further questions? <laughs> Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think I have one more question about, uh, but I didn't uh, remember the name um, where we, we had these additional notes on the steering angle of the wheels. This um, this model had had a very special name. Um, uh, I think Sue introduced it. <laughs> what what was the name? I'm sorry. The Ackerman. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Ackerman model. Uh, my question to this model is. Um, or I did not understand if this model is only something like an additional note that we know that it the the wheels do have a different angle. Um, because if I want to implement this uh, bicycle vehicle model, the only idea I had where I can use this Ackermann model is when I want to print the position of the wheels, but we did not use this specialized, this individual positions in our model, in the actual model we use for the computation. It was, in, in, in my mind, it's at the moment just an additional note so that we know this is not the reality and we have to do something else. Is this correct? Or do we actually use these new steering angles of the wheels and this, um, yeah, do we use them in our bicycle model? I would need the Ackermann angle if you would design a vehicle, then you would uh, consider this. You would say, okay, uh, a certain uh, turning angle or a certain steering angle is, uh, so you have to transfer it to the, to the wheels. And you have to consider that uh, um, the steering angles are different at the, uh, at the right and left wheels. 
So it is a design question, not a question of, uh, of the modeling here. For this model. Did you get it? Okay, yes. Yeah, so we don't have to take this into account if we want to actually build a car with four wheels. This. Yeah, we don't consider that in, uh, in, in the model. In, in this model, we have just the steering angle. And we assume we have okay. just one steering angle. And if we want to map this steering angle to the two steering angles, uh, left and right, okay, then yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the right geometry would say the steering angles should be different due to geometry. Okay. Uh, the, um, yeah, the center, the center of turning or the line from the center of turning to the front wheel and to the, um, or to the front, uh, of course, to also to, to the rear. So to the left and to the right wheels should be per perpendicular. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is, this should be considered by designing the, um, the vehicle. If you would have the, uh, a vehicle with two independently uh, steered wheels. So if you could steer the wheels independently, you have to calculate which, uh, which steering angles to apply to the left and right wheels. If, if you connect the wheels uh, using a, a mechanical part, uh, I don't know the exact name of it, uh, then you have to consider it in, in the design. Yeah, that basically answers my question. Thank you. Welcome. Well, I, um, I have a yeah. question regarding the linearization. Um, so yeah. are, you, are you saying that um, the model itself cannot um, model the vehicle driving in a circle? Or are you saying that if you try to linearize it, then we cannot um, model a circle? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the model, the nonlinear model, we we derived in this lecture. You can use it to to drive in a circle. But if you would linearize it, because the model is, is highly nonlinear, if you linearize it, the deviation between the nonlinear model and the linear model is big, and you cannot use the model uh, in of course, what I'm speaking here uh, about circle and uh, 90 degrees, I, I mean here, if you would start here, choose a steering angle and would uh, let the model uh, compute the X and Y coordinates for, for the vehicle. So you initialize the, the model with with a steering angle and would let the vehicle go. Is it more clear now? Um, yeah, I, I think I got it, thanks. Okay. Uh, I have another question um, concerning that, what you just discussed, uh, why would you linearize it at all? I think I missed that part. Like if you have um, that out output done that we cannot uh, drive a circle anymore, why would you do that at all? Okay, uh, linearization is in general good for computation time or for designing controllers. Uh, for computation time, for example, if we would use this model as a constraint in an optimization problem, it would turn the optimization problem non-convex or then uh, the Computation time is uh, NP. I don't know if NP hard or, or NP complete, but at least NP. And uh, this is a reason why we uh, why we linearize models. Um, there are also methods to compute 
optimization problems uh, for linear, for nonlinear models, for using nonlinear models. Uh, but this could be uh, a reason why we would think of linearizing uh, models in general. Okay, thanks, I got it. Um, I have one more question. Um, if you say that the vehicle can't drive a circle, do you mean that can't drive a perfect circle so that you reach the position where you started? Or do you mean that we can't drive a circle at all so that we, I don't know, as you draw it, that we just drive in a completely another direction? Okay, after this lecture, I would ask uh, Patrick to draw this <laughs> picture nicely. <laughs> So using the nonlinear model, you can drive a perfect circle. Using the nonlinear model, the vehicle can drive a perfect circle. So just uh, put the vehicle at some point, uh, tell the vehicle to drive with a certain velocity and uh, uncertain steering angle, and the vehicle would drive a perfect circle. Of course, in simulations, because we are speaking here about a model, we are not speaking about the real vehicle, we are speaking about the model of the vehicle. If we would linearize the model, then we cannot use the linearized model to drive a circle because of uh, the linearization of the sine and cosine function, we cannot turn more than the 90 degrees. So this is the version of the linear. Okay, but do you model. do you linear, sorry do you linearize the model at just one point, or do you make a stepwise simulation and linearize the model in every point of the step? No, this means we linearize it at one point. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I thought that you that you make a stepwise simulation and then linearize the model at every point, and then I thought, okay, because of this, you can't make a perfect circle. But <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, what what you said, you would get uh, piecewise linear. Uh, yeah. Okay. Piecewise linear model. So okay, so you assume the sine function to be a linear function, and not linearize it at every point in your simulation. Okay, perfect. That answers my question. Yeah, we analyze it once. So I have to exercise drawings for the next lectures. So please excuse. So I'm not going to uh, go more to, to details or equations about, uh, yeah, about the single track model. So I will just explain the, the idea uh, behind it and uh, to, yeah, my goal is to raise your attention about modeling and how we uh, start modeling with uh, simple models, uh, having a lot of assumptions, and how we get to more and more complicated models, or more and more accurate models. When I say complicated, I mean at the same time accurate models. So the thing we do is we start cancelling assumptions um, to get from the kinematic to a kinetic to a single track model with forces, we start canceling uh, yeah, assumption number six, the velocity vectors at points A and B are parallel to the front and rear wheels respectively. Uh, we cancel this assumption and we use the Newton's second law for the forces and the moment balance and using these to, uh, yeah, the equations derived from Newton's second law and moment balance, we get uh, equations with forces. 
Um, even here, we uh, we could also uh, assume in in a first step that the uh, side slip of uh, of the tires is small to get a more detailed than the kinematic model, but not a very detailed model uh, with forces. And in a next step, we could cancel also this assumption that the angle is small and have more detailed model. So the model gets uh, very fast, more and more complicated. And I would like here to speak about uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, of, of such a model, what, what happens. So canceling more assumptions lead to more accurate and complex models, of course. But at the same time, you, we would have more difficulties to trace errors. And also what is very uh, time consuming and very difficult, or let's say, uh, yeah, more time consuming than difficult, we increase the effort of parameterization. If, we, if you think about uh, our kinematic model, please, if you know the answer, just turn on your microphone. Uh, what do we have to, uh, to do to parameterize the model? What are the parameters in, uh, in the model? Uh, which thing we have to, things we have to know before starting driving? So I will go back to the model. So I think this slide is good to see the parameters. Uh, yeah, I can, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, we need, still need to know the center of gravity and then we can uh, compute the forces on the wheels if we know the turning radius and the speed and the mass of the vehicle. So I'm not speaking here about forces, oh. I'm just speaking about the parameters of the kinematic model. And to parameterize this model, we should just know LR oh, yeah. and yeah. L wheel base. And we know then if we measure the wheel base and know the position of, uh, of the point we are deriving the model for. If it is the center of gravity or not, uh, this is uh, another question. So all what we should know to be able to use this model, we just need to, to know, uh, to measure two things, LR and LWB. That's all, and we can use uh, use the model. So if you if you look at it, this is a state. This is an external input or state. Uh, this is a state. Uh, this is a parameter, but uh, which depends on the parameters I I mentioned here. Completely the same. Here also totally the same for V dot and delta dot. Uh, it depends on the um, on the modeling, but for simple cases, there are no parameters to know uh, before. So the only things to parameterize are really these two parameters. And for more complicated model, we should know a lot more, a lot, a lot more about the, the vehicles and the effort of parameterization increases rapidly. So what I would like to show you now is uh, a video showing where 
such models, su such complicated models could be useful. Uh, I'm not doing advert my advertisement here for any products, but I uh, consider this example as uh, a very good example showing uh, what we can do if we have more and more complicated models. So we can uh, slide with the vehicles. Of course, they use here uh, some tricks. It is not uh, really 100% like uh, road vehicles, the mechanical uh, parts are a little bit different, but you see what we, uh, what you can, you can do using more complicated models. So this, uh, we have two of these uh, vehicles at our chair. Uh, at the moment we can, uh, we can use just uh, one because it is due to the pandemic, it is allowed to, uh, to have just one person per room. So if you would like to, to play with it, maybe uh, next year it would be possible to, to visit our chair and you can also ask us to uh, play a little bit with these uh, drifting vehicles. Well, after a single track model, we can also have a multi-body model. What we do, we cancel more and more assumptions from the assumptions we uh, introduced uh, using the kinematic model. Um, yeah, the multi-body model is useful to use as a reference model, not more as a control model, uh, maybe for, for simulations. It is uh, as always in, in models, more complicated, more accurate models are uh, more close to, uh, to the reality. And yeah, this makes them more suitable for uh, using as reference models. This means to evaluate models or as simulation models. So for the evaluation of the lateral models, go to the MATLAB exercises and uh, also please use the code uh, provided by the TUM, the Technical University of Munich, uh, together with Common Group. Uh, it is also very well documented and uh, they have also um, the code available in, uh, in MATLAB. So the next part, now we are done with the uh, vehicle models. In the next part, we will speak about model predictive control and about sequential convex programming. It is a method to solve uh, non-convex programs. And we will have also two flipped classrooms, one about model predictive control and one about uh, sequ sequential convex programming. Um, yeah, for the flipped classroom uh, in the next part, you will be able also to, it, to watch videos, not just uh, read. And we will send you what to, to prepare. So for the model predictive control, it, it's going to be group B and for sequential convex programming, it's going to be group C um, to prepare um, yeah, the, the flipped classroom. Um, so I would like also to, men to mention at this point, uh, if you uh, felt lost, if you don't feel very comfortable till now in, especially in the part of vehicle models, don't worry. 
just understand the basic idea behind modeling, just understand what is a model, and this will be enough to understand the, uh, the next part. Of course, deeper knowledge is better, but if you feel you, you didn't get every single equation, you didn't get every single idea, don't worry. Uh, we are going to use just the model idea in, uh, in the next part and in the part after it. So please uh, keep on track and you will get valuable knowledge. What I would like also to mention at, uh, at this point, uh, I've discussed a point for the lab with Patrick about the, um, the lab tasks. And uh, in the last year, we, we have defined a lab task the students should, uh, should do in, in the lab. And for this year, we thought uh, you can do the default task we provide, just solve the task and you're done. But also it is possible that you come with your own ideas and say, okay, fine, uh, this task I understood, but I don't like to, to solve this one. I would like to define a different one and solve it. Um, so you are completely free to define your own task in your team or in your group. And uh, yeah, the process of defining the, the new task, if you would like to, to define one, just uh, just tell us and uh, we, we will support you defining a task. And we will have at least uh, one constraint on, on the task that the vehicles at the end should uh, be networked. And the function you are going to show in, in, the, in the lab should show something uh, useful for network vehicles. So I'm not uh, reading the, the questions in, in the chat, but uh, I saw one question about the next, uh, about next week. So these two parts are not going to be for next week. Um, I will think about B, group B for next week. Model predictive control could be next week, but definitely uh, sequential convex programming is not going to be uh, next week. I mean the flipped classroom. So if you have to, um, to prepare something for group B now, I'm telling you, we will inform you, uh, I hope by tomorrow. So this is the end of this lecture. I enjoyed it, especially the flip part. So thank you very much again for presenting. Um, uh, if you would have questions, just stay in, in this room. If not, see you next week. Bye-bye.